Institute for the Intersection of Law and Technology. Uh, he is the author of uh, Unprecedented the Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, which has been described as the definitive account of the Affordable Care Act and uh, the NFIB legislation, or litigation, excuse me. Uh, he is also the author of the forthcoming Unravels Obamacare, Religious Liberty, and Executive Power. Um, he also is a regular blogger at joshlikeman.com. Uh, he also is the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, which is exactly the way it sounds like it is. Um, it's more of a nightmare now, though, to be frank. Uh, okay. uh, he is the author of a number of, of uh, numerous law review articles, including most recently uh, The Process of Marriage Equality. With co author? Uh, co author, brilliantly, in the existing Constitutional Law Quarterly. Uh, welcome, Professor Black. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, actually, David and Ron were my Colonel professors, and I'm different with Howard and uh, many of the people here. All errors are attributed to them. So unfortunately, David and Jonathan stole my thunder entirely on Obamacare. As it turns out, we are among the, the core locus of anti-Obamacare professors, but I will do my best. So the thrust of my discussion today is not just what the president has done, but how he has justified it. And specifically, the relationship between gridlock and executive power. And it seems that today, the magic word in Washington is gridlock. Gridlock, gridlock, gridlock. Stuff can't be done. The parties are butting their heads, right? There may as well be a wall going down the middle of Congress with nothing coming in between it. This has been the defining theme of the Obama presidency. And I want to walk you through distinct aspects of how this has happened with respect to Obamacare, immigration, and foreign policy. Are we talking about Libya? Bergdahl and ISIS and things that David's talked about earlier. So our story begins with the National Labor Relations Board. Okay, this is a governmental organization, a so-called independent agency, that has authority to make labor policy. Very influential. The board has five people with five seats. As the rule goes, if they drop below three seats, that is only have two commissioners, they lose a quorum. And once they lose their quorum, they can no longer transact business. So people with memories will recall that during the Bush administration, there were all these efforts saying, shut down the NFI, uh, NFIB, shut down the NLRB, shut them down, right? Close them down, deny them a quorum. And indeed, towards the end of the Bush administration, they were down to two members. They thought, wait a minute, we can issue our decisions anyway. We're not going to listen to the silly quorum rule. It looks so lonely in the hallway, don't they? Um, they issued decisions. Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't do that. You need three. This does not work. So this gridlock for the NLRB continued into the Obama presidency, except the roles reversed. Now the GOP says we need to stop these people from going to the board. This was one of uh, Obama's nominees, Craig Becker, who was a former union lawyer, nominated, you know, like the you know, chickens, it was the, the fox to the hen house, so to speak. And his nomination occasioned a massive political brawl. They ran all these commercials saying, stop Craig Becker, don't let him get nominated. And indeed, the Republicans held firm and filibustered him, and they blocked his nomination. This put the NLRB's quorum under fire. They were about to drop below three members, and once they did, the president would no longer be able to implement his labor agenda. It's an independent agency, but, but you get the drift. So what happened? The president turned to our favorite, the recess power, right? The recess appointment power. He decided, I will use my recess power. Now, I love this quote from Mark Twain, no man's life, liberty, or property are safe while well, the legislature in session. Indeed, now, even when they're not in session, our liberty is still in peril. And the recent appointment clause has been used throughout history, but what happened in January of 2012 is very interesting. So on January 3rd, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia comes into the Senate, gavels in, says a few words, gavels out. The entire session was barely 35 seconds. In fact, I think it took me longer to describe it than the actual second happened. This is what's known as a pro forma session. These began during the Bush presidency to deny people like uh, Miguel Estrada and others positions on the courts. And what happened was in 2012, every three days, the Senate held one of these pro forma sessions. So there these series of 72 hour gaps. Now, in the history of the world, or the history of America, these 72-hour gaps were never deemed long enough to make a recess appointment. Indeed, the Bush Office of Legal Counsel said 72 hours is too short. You can't do this. So President Obama's Office of Legal Counsel said, no, you can do it. How? They determined that these pro forma sessions, which conceivably are very silly, 
are not actually real sessions of the Senate. Therefore, the Senate wasn't just a break for 72 hours, they would break for nearly two weeks. And it was during this time that President Obama made three appointments to the board, they now have five people, they're very happy, they can make labor policy. But this gave rise to a case called Noel Canning. Noel Canning was a Pepsi bottler in Yakima, Washington, and they had a run-of-the-mill labor dispute in which the board was involved. But instead of just challenging the board's uh, ruling, they challenged their jurisdiction and said, you lack a quorum, you cannot rule against us. This went to the D.C. Circuit, and in, a, and in an amazing opinion by the D.C. Circuit, I think it was Judge Santel, they held that you can't make these recess appointments, and oh, by the way, any sort of a break, any recess during a session, that's also not a valid point. The case goes to the Supreme Court. President Obama is defending his policy. And the most stunning aspect of the Supreme Court's decision in NLRB versus, uh, not Jones and Laughlin, uh, but Noel Canning, right? It was unanimous. It was a unanimous decision by Justice Breyer. Okay? When Justice Ginsburg finds that you violate the separation of powers, you really violate the separation of powers, right? This is not a close call. Okay? You're in trouble. Okay? So the decision was by Justice Breyer, and Justice Breyer, who worked in the Senate for many years for, Justice, uh, for Senator Ted Kennedy, understood Senate rules. He, he, he doesn't get everything. He gets this. He gets this quite well. And he said, look, right, look, when the Senate says they're in recess, they're in recess, and you, as a president, you can't ignore them. I don't care what happens. But Scalia had his own take. Now, he didn't dissent from the majority opinion. It was labeled a concurring opinion, but it was pretty much a dissent. Um, and in Scalia classic fashion, it was a Scalia dissent. And God bless his soul. Uh, I hope one day someone can write to his level, but Mr. Ramsey over here, I don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. But one of the themes that came up during arguments in the Noel Cannon case was that of intransigence, right? This idea of gridlock. And again, Justice Kagan, who, who I've become a huge fan of in recent years, uh, made a very astute point to the Solicitor General. She said, look, this is how I mean Supreme Court stuff. She said, look, the recess power, right? This was designed for the horse and buggy era. But you're not dealing this for uh, uh, absence, right? This is not a problem of congressional absence. This is a problem of congressional intransigence, right? Obama used the recess power here because Congress would not confirm Craig Becker. That is why he used it. It wasn't a case where Congress was out of town, they're on their farms, can be brought back. So then the Solicitor General made a statement that I still find stunning to this day. Um, every time I read it, I can't believe he said it. He said, this is a verbatim quote, the recess power acts as a safety valve, given that intransigence. Let's say it again. The recess power acts as a safety valve, given that intransigence. What does that mean, right? A safety valve, right? When Congress gets all steamed up, like a little teapot, right, and, and, and the president can't handle it, you can be flexible with the Constitution. You can let a little bit of steam, right? You can, you, can, you can let out all the pressure on Capitol Hill. Wow. Wow. The Constitution bends when Congress doesn't give the president what he wants. That's a stunning assertion. In fact, Justice Alito was blown away. like, that's a very aggressive assertion of executive power. How can it be that when there's all this pressure, then, and this slide's been here for a while, I've given this talk before, John Roberts said about Senate nominees, quote, the Senate has an absolute right not to confirm any nominees. <laughs> this has been my slide pack for a while. Lest you think John Roberts knows things about filibusters, Barack Obama tried to block him as he tried to uh, block Sam Alito as senator. But Roberts said, look, if the Senate wants to leave the seat empty, that is their prerogative. I would humbly submit the same applies to the Supreme Court, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Or maybe it is, I don't know. But this lesson of gridlock pervaded the opinions, and both Scalia and Breyer agreed on this point. They don't agree on a lot, but again, when Breyer is striking you down for violation of the separation of powers, you're doing something awfully wrong. So Justice Breyer made a very astute point. He said, if the Congress is gridlocked, this is a political problem and not a constitutional one. Indeed, the same lessons, I think, apply to the current Supreme Court vacancy. This is a political problem, not a constitutional one, right? The problem, the, the solution to gridlock is the bully pulpit, right? This platform the president has that he can exert pressure like no other figure in the world on the political process, and we have an election to, uh, to, to size. Uh, but rather than using the, the, uh, the bully pulpit, the president would prefer to use his pen and phone. And this leads me to the second portion of my discussion of how President Obama has justified his executive action. He said, very frankly, these are quotes, 
I take executive action with a serious problem, and Congress chooses to do nothing. I emphatically reject the principle of this. When Congress says no, they are not doing something. I'm sorry, they're not doing nothing. They're doing something. They're making a certain thing. We don't want the seats to be filled. We don't want this bill to be passed. That is a doing something. Okay? Justice Scalia's you know, concurring slash dissent in Noel Cannon made a few points that are very astute. He referred to this intransigence, saying, look, this is not a bug to be fixed. This is a calculated feature of our constitutional framework. As James Madison said, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. When we have gridlock, that means things are working, right? We can have parliamentary systems where you throw out the prime minister when it becomes unpopular. That's not our rule. Indeed, the president has a duty. Respectfully, Congress has no duty to act in good faith. They have none. They can be a bunch of jerks and throw the bums out, but they have no duty. The president, however, has a duty to faithfully execute the law. And both Jonathan and David have touched on this today. You know, has the bill become a law? Does Congress have any obligation to become to pass a bill? None. They have no duty. They can leave that poor bill crying on the steps of Capitol, kick down the steps wherever he goes. No duty whatsoever. However, the president doesn't see it that way. His brief time in the Senate perhaps uh, didn't teach that lesson. He said, we can't afford to wait for Congress. I'm going ahead and moving without them. Indeed, on his website, and David graciously quotes me this in his book, but on his website, he actually sells buttons saying, we can't wait. And he lists all the various times we're taking executive action in the face of this congressional intransigence. This is actually a plus, right? This is something he's proud of. He extols how he takes executive action when Congress will give the legislation that he wants. And I emphatically reject this principle. Another quote from Justice Scalia's opinion, no canning, convenience and efficiency. These are not objectives in our constitutional framework. They're not. They're not. I, I, there's no argument to the contrary. We have supermajority reasons. That Michael's talking about the treaty power, the electoral college, I and mean, there's so many gridlock and, and, and firewalls stopping things from happening quickly. That's not how our system works. And when Congress does not act with the requisite majorities, we stay put, we maintain the status quo. But the lesson of the last seven years has been when Congress insists on obstruction, and obstruction is basically saying no to what the president seeks, and, and whether it's reasonable or not, the voters can decide. I'll keep taking action on my own. So how do we understand this from a constitutional framework? And I think our canonical frame is Youngstown, right? Youngstown G2, uh, Justice Robert Jackson, of course. President Truman, he tried to take the steel mills himself, right? He tried to take them himself, and he said, you know what, Congress, you didn't do your job, I'm gonna do it myself. And the Supreme Court said, no, you cannot have the steel mills, you can't have them, okay? And the reason why is that the eminent domain power belongs in the legislative branch, not the executive branch. And the court in the middle of the war struck him down. As David points out, all the Roosevelt appointees voted against Truman. All the Truman appointees voted for him. Make of that what you will. But the most significant decision was that of Robert Jackson. Justice Jackson said, we have to see where is Congress's power? Where is the president's power? Are they lining up? What tier are we in, right? Um, we're in the lowest step here because Congress was asked before. Right? Congress was asked in the Labor Management Relations Act of 1948, your favorite statute, right? Mr. President, you know, can we give you this power of seizure? And Congress said no. So the exact power that Congress withheld, the president then asserted. Which brings us to our current world, which is, I guess, figuratively called a twilight zone in many respects. This reality that's in our state of Florida at the present moment, whatever is happening on Tuesday will happen. But what I'd like to advance is has the president been acting at his lowest ebb? Okay, this is not to say that it's unconstitutional. I can give you another lecture on that later if you like. But let's talk about how Congress and the president view these actions. And David saw my thunder about four hours ago, and John saw about 30 minutes ago. Let's talk about Obamacare, right? My, 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 my bane. So we have the Obamacare individual mandate, which says starting January 1st, 2014, unless you have this qualified health care plan, you have to pay a monthly uh, penalty, okay? Or tax for your Supreme Court, whatever. Um, of course, of course, the reason why this promise can never be kept, this promise we like your policy can keep it, is because of the mandate. The mandate says you have to have very comprehensive health insurance, and if you have a skimpy policy, it does not fly. As David mentioned earlier, so he stole my thunder, uh, this was deemed the lie of the year. What happened next is interesting. Congress is not stupid. And maybe they are, but they're not that stupid. Okay? <laughs> 
When members of their constituencies are getting their policies canceled by the millions, don't you think their constituents are calling saying, hey, Senator Landry of Louisiana, Senator Manchin of West Virginia, can you pass a bill saying I can keep my health insurance? Of course they're going to listen to that. In the Senate, a bill was introduced to say, if your policy was valid in 2013, it'll be valid in 2014. A very similar bill was passed in the House. The House bill passed with Democrats voting for it. What do you think President Obama did when the House passes a bill saying that you can keep your policy? Do you think he would say, Senate, go vote on this. We're going to need to keep this. Do you know what he said? He should have veto threat. He said a bill delaying the mandate would sabotage the ACA. And then you know what he did two weeks later? He did it himself. The exact thing which he said would sabotage the ACA by statute, he then implemented by executive action. This is indefensible. There's no defense. Right? We can talk about prosecutorial discretion, whatever else, but there's no defense for this. Why did he do it by himself? I'll tell you why. He was afraid Congress would add other stuff to the statute. Right? They would try to repeal other unpopular aspects of Obamacare. For him, it's sacrosanct. It cannot be touched. It must be left in pristine condition. This is a gridlock theory of executive power. This happened again. This is my grandfather Claus argument, right? <laughs> Even though Congress was behind it, he opposed it because he didn't want people tinkering with his law. This is such a lowest ebb example, so low ebb, okay? David and Jonathan also talked about it. Next example, the employer mandate. This is even worse. The employer mandate was supposed to go into effect January 1st, 2014. In July of 2013, six months in advance, right? Six months in advance, the president said, you know what? We're just gonna delay it a year. We're not even gonna wait to get to the deadline. Why? The president admitted, he said, businesses came to us. He admitted that in an interview. There was outright rent seeking. Or businesses that we don't pay for this, we delayed it. But then even worse, right? Even worse, as the website was sputtering along and the floppy disks were being put into the hard drive, what happened? They delayed it again. But they didn't just delay it. They said, okay, if you're a business between five, 50 and 100, you get one set of rules. And if you're this business, you get another set of rules. This is executive lawmaking. This is even pretending to be uh, modifying uh, you know, due dates, whatever. Uh, I don't know if it will ever go into full effect. It probably will never be. So basically, all these companies got these out-of-jail-free cards, uh, uh, never went into effect. Uh, lowest step. And indeed, Professor Foley has been instrumental in this. The House of Representatives has filed a lawsuit, which is currently pending in district court in D.C., uh, which involves a delay of the mandate. In my remaining time, I want to talk about immigration, which fortunately David and Jonathan have stolen my thunder on yet. Um, also, we have the DREAM Act, right? This was a bill that would have given a pathway to citizenship for the dreamers. Minors who came to the United States when they were kids and they went here legally, whatever. There was a massive movement to pass the DREAM Act. Congress considered it. It passed the House. It didn't get through the Senate. Okay? So you think that would be the end of it, right? Congress rejects your policy and then you move on to the next thing. No, 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 right? So six months later, the president announced his policy deferred action. DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, this was a policy that basically said, we will not deport you, and oh, by the way, we'll give you uh, uh, you know, work authorization, et cetera. I'm not going to discuss whether it's constitutional now, but the point I want to stress is Congress rejected this class of aliens as deserving these benefits, and the president discovered a heretofore known authority to give it exactly what Congress said no to. It's the same pattern, Lois said. DAPA. Okay, this came after the Gang of Ed bill. We are, we are junior senator, or is he senior senator now? Whoever it is, Rubio, uh, uh, tried to have a comprehensive immigration reform bill. Passed the Senate, defeated in the House. The same day John Boehner said he would not bring it for a vote, the president said, quote, I will fix the immigration system on my own without Congress. Who the heck is this guy, right? Congress rejected your plan. They said no. They said no. And then when did he do it? After the election, two weeks after the midterm elections, he announced the exact policy, which would have given a series of benefits and work authorization and deferred action to these people. Um, this policy was challenged by my home state of Texas. Uh, back in Texas, how we view, how we view things. Uh, I filed a number of briefs in this case. Um, I've argued that this violates a take care clause, but that's not, that's beyond the scope. Let's go into foreign policy, right? Right, let's talk about Libya. David mentioned this in his book. Um, we were going after Libya. They had a civil war, Gaddafi, I don't even remember what the heck it was about, but we were bombing them, right? But the problem was there was never a congressional authorization. There was never one. So we kept dropping bombs, dropping bombs, but then we were running to the War Powers Act, right? What's the War Powers Act? 
It was passed after Nixon's invasion of Cambodia, and it basically says, you have 60 days, Mr. President, before getting congressional authorization. You have 60 days. So did the president go to Congress for authorization to bomb Libya? Of course not, because they wouldn't have given it to him. So what did he do? As David explains very well in his book, he asked a law professor, Harold Hongju Ko. Actually, it's even worse. So first he went to the DOJ and said, hey, can I keep bombing Libya after 60 days? And they said, no. Then he went to the uh, DOD, can I keep bombing Libya after 60 days? They said, no. It's like when mom says no and dad says no, you go to grandpa, right? So they went to Harold Coe. And Harold Coe says, of course you can do it. Why? As David says, bombing was not military action. Bombing the blitz out of a country was not actually military action. What they call it was a kinetic military action. Hostilities. Yeah, yeah. Bombing a country was not hostilities. It was kinetic military action. Therefore, it was not governed by the War Powers Act. Give me a break. Congress didn't give what you wanted, and you have this absurd explanation of how you could otherwise. Uh, Harold Coe wrote a you know opinion uh, um, uh, giving giving him this War Powers um, lowest step, right? Bergdahl. This one's even worse. Okay. I'm almost done. This is my last one. So the National Defense Authorization Act, right? This was a statute that funds all military stuff. And one of the provisions of the NDAA says you cannot release certain high-value detainees from Guantanamo Bay because they're really dangerous. If you want to release them, give Congress 30 days notice. Okay? Didn't happen. So one day out of the blue, President Obama had a press conference where he announced that he exchanged for the release of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, who's currently on charges of AWOL and other things that are quite bad, and they swapped Bergdahl for the Guantanamo Five. These were five very high-value detainees at Gitmo. Okay? Did he give Congress 30 days notice? Of course not. Why? Because that would have ruined the deal, right? It's the art of the deal. So the Senate went crazy. Even, 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 even <laughs> Dianne Feinstein was like, the House and Senate were against this unanimously. The president asked many times, can we release Bergdahl for these five guys? The Senate kept saying, no, 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 no. So how did the president justify this? Well, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel called his best friend John Yu and said the president has power to Article 2. We've come full circle, my friends. Right now, the Obama presidency is justifying removing people from Gitmo using Article 2, whereas Bush used Article 2 to put them there in the first place. We've come, we've come full circle. Um, again, this is an action of lowest step. Congress said, no, you can't do this. He said, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, uh, oh, right, one more. ISIS. Military action against ISIS. We have not declared war against them. We're still bombing the blitz out of them. What was the rationale? Well, there were two possible ones. There was the 2001 AUMF against Al-Qaeda and the 2002 AUMF against Iraq. The problem is ISIS is neither Iraq nor Al-Qaeda. So I had the president justify this. I swear, I teach property also. He said that. ISIS is a true inheritor of Osama bin Laden's legacy. Got in fee simple, right? ISIS actually inherited, <laughs> ISIS inherited bin Laden's legacy. So in fact, ISIS is actually Al Qaeda. Done. And oh, by the way, I, Iraq is close enough. Whatever. Now moving into Libya, it doesn't even matter. Whatever. Gridlock executive power. This is a very challenging and dangerous topic. Um, and, and I leave you with this thought. Um, for a moment. Okay. Thank you very much.